Hey guys, um, so I have Dr. Seafried of Boston College and uh, Stephanie Person on with me today. Um, I just want to start by asking you guys a question. So if you were told about the origin of cancer and of treatment options that require minimum costs and that are non-toxic to the patient, what would it take for you to believe that that might be a possibility? Um, I just want to say that uh, I'm, I'm very thankful to have this, this discussion with both of you guys today. And uh, I was hoping we could start off by you guys introducing yourselves and uh, perhaps we could start with Dr. Seafried. Yeah, well, hi, Scott. It's nice to be here. Uh, I'm Tom Seafried. I'm a professor of biology at Boston College. And um, we teach uh, uh, undergraduate students and graduate students uh, in biology and in cancer biology. And uh, Stephanie? Yes, I am, how do I explain this? Um, I'm of the people. I'm a person who worked with my mother with a cancer therapy through the ketogenic diet years ago, 15 years ago. And eventually through my own research and working with 6,000 people, I've developed um, a platform where I can help people through all, not just cancer, but all types of, of ailments. So that's how I started with my mother and then it sort of transformed into all types of uh, physical ailments that I uh, coach people on. Yeah, I have to say Stephanie's my own personal keto coach and um, she's been on Dr. Oz and they have both been on Dr. Berg. I think that's how I discovered both you guys. Oh, well. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, Dr. Seafree, I just want to start by asking you on the, your ideas on cancer and the origin of cancer. And uh, where are we mistaken in our beliefs on cancer? Well, I, I think um, right now, uh, the, the general view is that cancer is a genetic disease. And uh, that's been solidified in tens of thousands of research papers in the scientific literature and also on the... Um, uh, National Cancer Institute website from the federal government of the National Institutes of Health. Um, so most, most therapies that are being produced are based on the, um, the genetic uh, theory, the somatic mutation theory of cancer. And uh, most of the treatments that are being given to patients in hospitals currently, the so-called standards of care, are based in one way or another on the view that cancer is an extremely complicated disease um, requiring uh, various kinds of targeted therapies based on some uh, genetic abnormality that these uh, cancer cells might, might have. The, um, this this uh, evidence is now accumulating to say that that concept is no longer supported by a significant amount of scientific evidence indicating that the uh, origin of cancer uh, ri ri uh, is due to defects in the um, energy uh, capability of the cell, uh, basically the mitochondria of the cell. This was originally proposed by Otto Warburg in the 1920s. Um, and um, you know, we in our research here have supported a large amount of what uh, Otto Warburg had originally indicated in the origin of cancer. He was, he was both correct and incorrect on some of his ideas, but I think the main idea, it's a very simple one, is that when the cell cannot generate energy through respiration, it falls back on fermentation, ancient, ancient uh, pathway for uh, energy metabolism. Um, and that's what drives the dysregulated growth of the cells. So all, all cancer cells that we have studied so far, uh, regardless of what the type of tissue or cell, they all, they all ferment. Fermentation is energy without oxygen. So basically cancer cells are fermenters. Um, and that's a, uh, once you know that, then it becomes very clear uh, as how to manage the disease. In other words, they can't live without fermentation fuels. And those fuels are very limited. And that's only the sugar glucose and the amino acid glutamine. So, um, and they can't burn uh, ketones or fatty acids because you need a good mitochondria to do that. So the strategy for managing cancer now becomes very clear. Target their fermentation while moving the body into nutritional ketosis. 
and this will work on the majority of cancer patients as a non-toxic uh, parsimonious way to manage the disease. It's just gonna take, I don't know how many years it will take um, for people to come to know this. Uh, and that's where we are today. Dr. Seafried, um, I, f I feel like, you know, I, I've heard you say in interviews before that this movement towards this, these ideas on cancer aren't going to come from the medical establishment, that they're going to come from perhaps a grassroots movement from the general public. And um, I think I'll just start by sort of asking, you know, and, and making a bit of an appeal to authority because sometimes you need to do that. Um, you know, aside from Otto Warburg and yourself, um, are there any, is there any, any research in the literature or any other prominence or researchers um, that you have to back up these claims? Well, of course there is. I mean, there's a large number of papers uh, uh, indicating that mitochondria are defective in, in tumor cells. Uh, there's, you know, we all, we, uh, almost everyone knows that um, uh, the, the higher the glycolytic, which is a, a glucose fermentation pathway, the more aggressive the tumor is. So, so clearly there's a lot of evidence uh, to support this. But at the same time, you have to realize there is, um, like everything today, there's some misinformation that seems to constantly be present in, in the papers. See, I, I work in the world of, of, of scientific research. We, we are judged by the types of papers that we publish in peer reviewed journals. And there is a lot of um, you know, back and forth. The, the, there's much dust that has not yet settled. The biggest problem that we see why the, the, the majority, why many, many, well, there's, there's two major problems. One, the major problem is a dogmatic ideological dogma that cancer is a genetic disease. And when you have been nurtured in that view, no matter what the evidence uh, that is presented, it cannot be accepted. Um, and uh, you'd, you'd say scientists should be open-minded. No, they're not. Uh, they have been locked into whatever their uh, particular hypothesis or theory that generates their research is just as strong as any dogma, a religious dogma, a political dogma, whatever it is. You don't get people to easily switch from one religion to another. It just does not happen. Mm. Um, and there are in science, there are theories, and those theories are embraced by a lot of people, and especially the dogmatic view that cancer is a genetic disease, which is, is driven by uh, a, a lot of uh, very powerful interest groups. That's one problem. The, uh, that's probably the major problem. The other problem is in the, in the met metabolism field itself, where Otto Warburg had been criticized by many people for uh, his insistence that mitochondria were defective when cancer cells take in oxygen, making them look at, like they're normal. Uh, we and others have clearly shown that that oxygen consumption in a tumor cell is not used for ATP synthesis. It's used for reactive oxygen species production, which causes the mutations in the nucleus. A lot of people cannot accept this, yet we have hard evidence, others have hard evidence. So it's a, it takes time for the field to come to recognize uh, what is uh, there and what's, what's real and what's not real. What are the mis misinterpretations? What are the misconceptions? And we're in the process of slowly uh, resolving these issues. We may never be able to resolve the dogmatic issue that cancer is not a genetic disease, despite all the evidence that we have, because there's just some people that refuse to believe that. And you know what can you do? Um, but the, I think the grass. I, I, as you're you're right, Scott. I, I think that the people themselves who are going to be the major beneficiaries of this new revolution in understanding cancer. They're the ones that are open to this. They're the ones who do not want to be treated with toxic radiation and these uh, horrible poisonous chemicals to manage their disease. So they're listening and they're listening carefully and they will put the pressure on the establishments to make the start making the changes. Because don't forget the patient is the consumer. The cancer patient is the consumer. If the patient becomes educated and knowledgeable, they will ask very important questions to their caregivers. And the caregivers better know the answers to these questions. Otherwise, they're going to go somewhere else. It's just that simple. 
there's just so much that that you have to go up against though right i mean um not only in terms of the uh sort of the medical establishment and in terms of the revenue generation that, that comes from these uh, their traditional therapies but also from that sort of dogmatic view of the public you know they've been told since birth that cancer is something else and it's very complicated and you know when people get told something so simple like this that you could treat it in sort of a non-toxic way at you know very low cost or whatever the treatment options that you, you mentioned um it almost seems unbelievable and I've seen this in terms of, you know, I had Dr. Natasha McBride on my podcast and she sort of said something to me, it was just kind of simple. She said, you know, whatever you've been told by the pharmaceutical industry or the medical establishment, it's pretty much the complete opposite in terms of what's best for, for health outcomes. Um, and I've, I've found this to kind of be true in, in my case, you know, in terms of uh, my podcast is, is very much like diet related. And trying to get people off the idea that fat is bad for them um, and, and ketogenic diets are, you know, are going to give them heart disease or cancer. And I mean, this is what we've been told by the medical establishment for so long. And we've seen a push towards um, their foods in terms of what they own in terms of our agriculture, the, their processed foods that they're uh, putting on the grocery shelves and everything and so on and so forth. So there's just so much to go up against. And I think that um, my view on it is if we sort of, uh, you know, take away, you know, what you were just saying there, I mean, me not coming from a scientific background, um, I can't understand a lot of that lingo. So trying to make this a little bit simpler for people to understand, right? Um, is there any, do you see any way of overcoming well, that? Well, here's the situation. All you, all, we, all you have to do is look at the track record. Uh, of the establishment. We have over 1,600 people a day dying from cancer in this country. And it's in China, it's over 8,000 a day. Obviously, they have a much larger population. And already in China, cancer has overtaken heart disease as the number one killer. So we have to look at the track record, okay? The track record is of the establishment. Let me give you an example. With the AIDS epidemic that happened uh, starting in the 80, or late 70s, 80s, I mean, AIDS was a, was a, a death sentence. Uh, all of a sudden, the drug cocktail was produced, and death from AIDS was dropped precipitously. That's what I call success, okay? Did they cure it? Maybe not cure it, but they certainly allowed people to live a lot longer with a higher quality of life than was. That shows dramatic effects. The cancer industry is anticipating that cancer is going to continue to rise and rise and rise, overtaking heart disease in the majority of countries <laughs> in the world. Okay, they are failing miserably in, in managing this disease. It, 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 that's obvious, it's, uh, it's obvious. However, with metabolic therapy, uh, we, we, and let me, let me say one more thing. We have millions of cancer, so-called cancer survivors, um, just like Stephanie's mother and many others. Um, but many, many, many cancer survivors from being treated with the current toxic uh, treatments uh, pay a big price for that. Many many survivors pay a big a big price. They have all kinds of other health issues as the result of surviving very toxic therapies. This can involve neuropsychiatric problems, digestive and hormonal issues, um, and a variety of other uh, uh, problems, uh, hormonal imbalances, and all these kinds of things. And now they become they become um, patients for all kinds of other problems that, that they did not have, but for the fact that they survived a, a lot of toxic treatment. You see, we can, we can reduce that significantly, possibly even eliminating. Uh, some of these cancer drugs that we're using could work uh, better and more effectively if the patient were to be in therapeutic ketosis at the time of their treatment. So, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, I think some pharmaceutical drugs and, and, the, and some people in the establishment might be pleasantly surprised to realize how powerful some of their drugs could be if their patients were placed in therapeutic ketosis before they were initiating their therapeutic interventions. Mm -hmm. uh, this is another possibility. Then they realize that, wow, if this patient is in therapeutic ketosis when we give this immunotherapy, they do a hell of a lot better and live longer. Eventually they will come to realize that you don't that the, the metabolic therapy by itself 
uh, with drug diet cocktails that we're working on here at Boston College is going to ultimately replace the majority of therapies that people are currently being treated with. So it's just a matter of time. We, I, I, my group and I understand very clearly what the origin of cancer is, and we understand very clearly what we need to do to manage it. And we keep publishing the papers and the results come, the more and more patients that survive longer with a higher quality of health, the word gets out. The word gets out and says, I wanna do that. I wanna do what they're doing there. And, uh, and then gradually things begin to change. But uh, right now, most people run to their top medical schools, whatever, wherever it is, in, in Texas, California, wherever it is, the top medical schools, and they're not told about any of this stuff. And it's, it's a problem because many of the uh, oncologists themselves have never been introduced into this material. So there's a re-education on the part of both the population and the caregivers that has to take place so we can better manage this disease. And I wanna get into to, you know, treatment options, how you, how you treat people and also outcomes, but I just wanna shift focus to Stephanie uh, for a few minutes. And I re really would like for Stephanie to share her story of her mother's journey with cancer. Yeah, um, okay, so with my mother's situation, she was, uh, I really love Dr. Seafried's said uh, explanation of uh, damage to the cells with through, uh, I guess, fermenta fermentation and a lack of uh, a reduced respiration. I think that's what you're, you're uh, talking about. Um, my mom was eating very poorly. So uh, there was no one else in her family lineage that had some kind of brain cancer. But my mother uh, was diagnosed with uh, glioblastoma when I found her on the floor, a neighbor found her on the floor seizuring. And so they took her into the hospital and then eventually they found out that she had a, a very massive growth of the tumor in her brain a glio, and right there, the outcomes of glioblastomas are pretty um, uh, dismal in, in, in terms of surviving one, especially as one as advanced as she had. Um, but I just remember prior to her diagnosis, me asking her, she was just getting fatter and bigger and more unhealthy. And I just kept saying, how are you? I'm fine. And I'm like, how's your blood pressure? I'm fine. And she kept saying that. I just felt something was going to pop. So I also have been feeling and talking with clients about just things not being connected to some kind of genetic link, but actually the, um, uh, the nature versus nurture argument, uh, it's a lot of what people do, if not everything people do to their own bodies. So with my mother, uh, I, I actually had heard about the ketogenic diet. I don't know how, because this is 15 years ago and it was unheard of then, very small rumblings of it. Um, so me as the average person, I don't know where I learned it from, but I just put her on some kind of ketogenic therapy at that point. It wasn't a very good one. So people ask what I did to her and I don't bother telling them because I had her on foods. I will not have her on now, but, and I will not say as to like 1000%, I stopped my mother's glio, but my brother and I, we, we did a bunch of things. We all, we took away her deodorant, her toothpaste, her, her, uh, her dishwashing soap, like anything that would be perceived as uh, chemical and, and toxic and replaced it with all organic and more natural products as well as a dietary uh, um, therapy or, or protocol. And then also was trying to get, get her to rest and my mother would never rest. She was just going, 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 never sleeping and just trying to change her entire lifestyle. But because of, um, of that moment at that time in my life, I had heard about the ketogenic protocol. Then I just tried to do whatever I could to get her started on whatever I thought was one. And she survived it. Uh, she kept going in for MRIs every two months. And so that she, she actually was radiated and given chemotherapy, which aged my mother 50 years overnight. Like people think my mother looks young now, but I can see the, the, the toll, the damage from those toxic chemicals. Uh, she really looked young prior to this. Um, and it was very interesting to hear Dr. Seafried talk about um, the, the, the chemotherapy and radiation protocols, like 
prior to us going live here, um, how toxic they are. But uh, even with that, uh, and they did give her uh, a surgery. I mean, it was, I don't know, felt like days it was coming back. The glio started growing back immediately, immediately. Mm -hmm. So after changing everything in her life and changing the diet, it just stopped. The lesion stopped in her brain. It just stopped. And it's mm -hmm. been there ever since. And she, they stopped giving her MRIs because there was no need to, because it didn't grow. So it didn't continue growing. So that's the story with my mom. I continued to, I, I did this protocol with my mother because we were saying before, prior to this discussion, uh, this recorded discussion, that it's very difficult to get people to change their diets unless they have a support system. So she had a support system, a huge support system, both both of her kids, my brother and I, were really just on her. And uh, she fought us tooth and nail. In fact, we had to go and throw away a 40-pound bag of sugar because she was baking sweet goods constantly and just eating them. And uh, we got rid of all of it. She really fought that. Uh, but she stuck with it and enough to get the, the, uh, the lesion to not continue to grow. And now I can't get her to eat right at all. But <laughs> at the time, uh, she did listen. And then that turned into me doing it myself and uh, uh, doing this ketogenic protocol. And I did it wrong, clearly, in the very beginning. I was eating a lot of nut butters and coconut oil and cheese, and those things are garbage, in my opinion. Uh, now, after the 15 years, and then from there, actually, I just went on YouTube. I was like, people need to know how important it is to cut out the sugars and processed foods and garbage and and try especially with people who are dealing with any type of autoimmune or any type of disease or cancer and cut out these foods and don't and not be so glucose dependent and try to to get into a state of ketosis and uh I just started talking about it I didn't know what I was talking about at the time I thought I did but I just was just yakking my head off about it and people started watching and then that just grew and grew and grew then Jimmy Moore put out a book called Keto, Keto, excuse me, Clarity, uh, with a bunch of other uh, doctors. And then from there, it just started growing and growing. And then I started working with people. So I ended up, I've, I've worked with over 6,000 people now. So now over the years, I actually tried the carnivore diet and I've tried, I, but now I, I see all the different uh, benefits to doing like a low carb, high fat protocol where you're still starch dependent or doing a short, very short-term high-fat ketogenic carnivore for the short-term to take down inflammation. Um, and then uh, for those who don't need to go that extreme and do carnivore, I take people and really put them on a ketogenic omnivorous diet. And I really, really go and see if they're having any type of inflammatory reaction, such as yourself, to some of these foods that are touted as healthy to what we perceive as healthy through, I don't know, how we're raised. And, and really try to figure out what people are reacting to. Because even with plants, some people react very poorly to certain plants, which can obviously wreak havoc on their gut. So that's my story. Yeah. And she hasn't had a, a recurrence in her cancer in, in 15 years. Since that no, was... not at all. I keep yeah. thinking it's going to come back because after... Oh, probably on the 10th year, my mother got tired of me just nagging her constantly, constantly. Like I just wouldn't accept... And people would say to me, oh, I can't get my parents to eat more healthy. And, and I'd say, well, you can never give up. You can never give up. Well, now that after 15 years, it's like, I, you know, she has it. She's having PTSD from me nagging her. <laughs> so <laughs> it has not come back. It has not returned. But it could. I keep like, what else is going to come back? You know, if, if not come back or what, il what else is she going to develop? Because every time I come and visit her, which uh, right now, I'm in the process of moving from Texas to Tennessee. So I'm going to go be that militant person back on her nag again. Now that I'll be living, it'll, it's so much easier to help her when I'll be very close to her in the same state rather than California and Tennessee. Yeah. But yes, I, I coached her from another state and now I'll be that right there with her to try to get her to eat healthy again. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard many stories like this. Uh, I actually read a book uh, by Dr. Boz, so if you guys could check that out, um, how she helped her mother uh, overcome cancer through a uh, ketogenic uh, uh, lifestyle. Um, Dr. Seyfried, I want to get back to you now um, in terms of treatment options. Um, say if, if you yourself were to uh, be diagnosed with cancer today, 
what route would you take? Uh, does it matter what type of cancer it is in terms of, um, uh, you know, having a therapeutic level of ketosis or, or uh, glutamine in inhibition or, um, yeah, maybe you could just sort of walk through that with well, us. Uh, let, me, let me just um, <clears throat> point out a couple of things. Um, um, in relationship to what, what uh, Stephanie was uh, sharing uh, with us. Um, I think Kelly Turner uh, wrote a book, uh, Radical Remission. And I think uh, in that book, one of the things that seemed to stand out was uh, radical changes in diet and lifestyle uh, uh, under, uh, was uh, underlying a lot of these radical remissions. And I think what Stephanie did with her mother was a kind of a radical, radical change in diet and lifestyle, <laughs> and um, you know, uh, so there is evidence. There is there is uh, prior evidence for these kinds of. It doesn't happen with everybody, but it certainly um, it certainly has been documented in Kelly Turner's book. So, uh, um, and you're right, Stephanie. It's not clear whether we can consider your mother cured or whether she is just uh, managed, mm. um, and. I don't like the term, do you, we have a cure for cancer because we never know, we can never know that uh, unless you die in your 90s from something other than cancer when you had cancer in your 30s. Okay, obviously you were cured from cancer and you died from something else. But we can never know whether or not we're totally cured. And that's not the point. The point is how long can we live with a higher quality of life knowing we've had a diagnosis of cancer? And, and that, I think, should be the, the, the point we strive for. Uh, I think, oh, I want to be cured for cancer. Well, maybe, maybe your mother is cured from cancer, but we won't know that. If she dies at 98 years old from heart disease, then she obviously was cured of glioblastoma. Right. So, um, so I think we have to keep, we have to reevaluate how we consider uh, a long-term survival and quality of life as the result of, of these kinds of treatments. So, so if I, if getting back to the question, also I have a commentary coming out in, in Nature Urology, commenting on two recent papers, again, speaking to what Stephanie was saying, um, where two, these were published uh, scientifically uh, uh, documented publications using two different kinds of diet approaches to managing prostate cancer. One was an intermittent fasting kind of an approach, and the other one was a low carbohydrate kind of approach. Uh, both, both papers, both independent studies came to a similar conclusion that the patients that could adhere to these kinds of treatments had a much better outcome than the patients that didn't adhere to these outcomes. So I think we have to be, like you said, some, there's a lot of flexibility that we have with using metabolic approaches, dietary metabolic approaches to managing cancer. There's not one uh, a rigid uh, approach. And I think the knowledge base of knowing flexibility, knowing what might work better for one patient than another, uh, certainly will move uh, long-term survival and quality of life farther than we, than we can uh, recognize uh, at this point. So keto ketosis is certainly uh, an underlying uh, therapeutic uh, modality that I think many people will benefit from. And uh, when I say that, all it means is lowering blood sugar levels and elevating ketone levels uh, mm. because the tumor cells can't survive very well under these kinds of, of, of radical changes. So, so um, you, and Scott, you asked what I would do if I were to be diagnosed with cancer. Well, the, fir the first thing I, I would do would get my body into nutritional ketosis. That's, that's the first thing. And we now know that various diets um, can do that. You don't have to go cold turkey, uh, which I mean by just water only fasting. Um, what we see is that when patients, and it's very difficult to go cold turkey. Uh, what I mean by that is just, okay, I'm just going to not eat anymore. I'm just going to drink water. Um, your body really, it's almost like breaking an alcohol or a nicotine addiction. It, where our brains are so geared for glucose in, in most of the members of our society that getting off glucose is just as hard as getting off alcohol or, or, or nicotine from cigarettes or any other kind of an addictive uh, situation. So you have to break that uh, addiction slowly. In my case, um, I, I would go on a low, a, a low carbohydrate uh, diet 
for a couple of weeks um, to get my body uh, uh, prepared and transition into this new metabolic state. Uh, once in the new metabolic, and also monitoring blood work very, very carefully. You need to monitor your blood work. You need to know where you, where you uh, are at the time of diagnosis, and you need to follow and see how your uh, lipid mar markers, vitamin marker, all the different markers are beginning to change. Once the body enters into the state of nutritional ketosis, and we have documented this with our glucose ketone index, which we published to help the cancer patients know when they're in nutritional ketosis. You can buy the equipment, uh, a Keto Mojo a glucose ketone index monitor and these kinds of things. Once I see that I have a GKI, glucose ketone index, of uh, 2.0 or below is when I would now begin to take uh, the drugs uh, that I know uh, will work synergistically with the nutritional uh, diet. We use embendazole, you know, some of these parasite medications. Uh, we use uh, 6-deoxynorleucine. I know it's a, ver a drug that can be very difficult to get for the majority of people. I know how to get it. I would get it for myself. I would have my friends administer it to me. And I know this because we've done the preclinical work on this. We know how powerful, when you know the types of drugs that work synergistically with the nutritional ketosis, this is the biggest thing. Once you know this, you know what to do. Now, the problem is a lot of, we're publishing these papers and people say, oh, you did it in a mouse. Listen, it, it's just as hard to manage cancer in a mouse as it is in a human. People say, oh, you know, and all major drugs that go into human clinical trials have been pre-tested in, uh, in preclinical model systems. They've been tested. You're not gonna just throw something on top of people that have not, that has not been uh, evaluated in, in a preclinical testing situation. So what we do is we know that there are drugs and uh, that work synergistically together with nutritional ketosis, thereby lowering the dosages of the drugs, thereby reducing the toxicity of these drugs, knowing that, that they will work much better in this new metabolic state. And this is the key. The key is dosage, timing, and scheduling, which we're still working on at this point. So once we have that uh, locked down, so what goes from my lab right into the clinics, because we're working with a lot of physicians. So I pretest all these things. So we're pretty much on top of what we think is gonna work the best. Whether it does or not, we have to have uh, larger patient populations, but we're already seeing in like uh, Stephanie's mother, many, many others, that this stuff really does, these strategies really do work if they're done correctly by knowledgeable people and support groups. I don't, I think what Stephanie said is so important. You need to have family support to do this because the, the type of changes are dramatically different from what other people in the same family might be doing. So it's a, it's a team effort, not, on the, not only on the part of the physicians, but also on part of the family members of the individual that has that, that uh, particular condition. So it, it's, it, but this, this will all come Right now, it's like um, you know people running around trying to figure out what do you do with this, how much, what should I eat this, can I eat that? You know, it's that kind of a situation. I always tell people, what's your GKI? What's your glucose ketone index? And they say, oh no, it's 15. Well, I said, well, we'll modify it until you get down to 2.0. Oh, I, I didn't know I have to do this. Well, and Stephanie and people like Stephanie may be able to modulate these kinds of things to get these people into the correct zone, and then the, the correct drugs non-toxic drugs would be used on, on this by professionals, of course. You don't do it yourself. I would never do it on my <laughs> that, uh that I work with, even though I know I would tell them what to do and how to do it. They would do it to me. I can't, I'm not doing it myself. But, but, but again, you need the professional staff to help you uh, do this. Uh, but you need to know what you're doing and why you're doing. And the other thing that uh, I spent a lot of time at the university doing is we teach scientific literacy. Um, the uh, general public is almost scientifically illiterate. Um, they have no clue as to why things work and why things don't work. Um, you know, it, it's just, it, it's, it's not only American society, it's just that many people throughout the world are basically scientifically illiterate. Yet all of the things in our society are driven by science and technology. And we have very little understanding of science and technology and therefore patients who really want to survive cancer, it's good, to their, it's good for them to gain some level of scientific literacy so they know what they're doing, why they're doing it and how it's going to work. It's only to their advantage. So this also requires, uh, so you see a lot of changes in a lot of different ways. Um, and there are some people who say, I don't want to know anything about anything. Just give me the, the pills and the radiation, I'll be fine. 
Listen, we're never going to take that away. If people want radiation and toxic pills, they'll always be there for those people. But I'm saying that we there might be other people who might not want that, and they should also have the op option to do that. Uh, Dr. Supri, I just want to say, so um, in terms of uh, the glutamine component of this, uh, which, which you touched base on briefly there, um, what... What would be the treatment option for that? Are there treatment options? I know that you had a drug that you talked about, Don, yeah. which no, I, I, I believe wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, or I believe was rejected. Um, are there any glutamine blocking drugs out there? there are, uh, yeah, well, well, of course, of course, there's many. In fact, the pharmaceutical industry is working very, very diligently. Uh-oh. Sorry, I think we're frozen up here. For the majority of patients, if that patient is not in therapeutic ketosis. I mean, mm. we've, done, we've done all these uh, treatments. There's a lot of drugs, like all these immunotherapies that people are talking about that you hear on the news at night, Optivo, Keytruda, and all those kinds of things. They will work much better if the patients are in therapeutic ketosis. None of the drugs that I see in the pharmaceutical industry being produced uh, are going to work as individual entities. They, they, they will help, help some people for sure. Uh, the majority of people will not be helped. And there will be just as, uh, uh, the, uh, there's gonna be a many people that are killed by those things, okay? That die quicker. And that's called hyper-progressive disease caused by the very treatment they're using. We wanna eliminate that. There's no reason that any human being should be treated with a therapy that's gonna kill them faster than the disease does. And yet this happens- So do you so think that those happens. therapies, uh, do you think that they create the fermentation that you're, uh, we're, you've been talking about? Well, sometimes they can. Yeah, sometimes they can. Sometimes they create uh, an immune storm, uh, uh, you know, what they call cy cytokine release cytokine syndrome. Storm. Yeah, yeah. A lot, of the, a lot of these kinds of things can happen to different people under different conditions. But, but the issue is that if you're in nutritional ketosis, uh, a lot of that can be eliminated. And the types of drugs that you use can be used in much lower concentrations. So you actually reduce significantly the level of toxicity uh, when, when doing these things. So uh, the, problem, the problem we have in the, in the industry right now is that they say, well, we can't believe it unless you do a double blind crossover study in a large number of patients. What, what, what is that? That's a single drug, a uh, double blind crossover. You can't, that's not gonna work. That, that, that mindset has to be changed completely because you're doing diet drug cocktails here. And there's no way you can have this guy take that one drug, the other guy take the other drug, the other guy do the diet without the drugs. I mean, this is absurd. Uh, the, the, what's the bottom line here? The bottom line is how long can we keep people alive for a longer period of time and a higher quality of life? That's the end point, you know? Um, and I think that, that, so the whole concept of clinical trials for cancer has to be done differently. And, and then we're gonna see the real movement. We're gonna see the real progress uh, once we start to change that. When, how, when will that, the patients themselves have to demand this. They have to be demanding of, the, of their, and I, I believe that medical establishment, the physicians will want to do this because ultimately their, their goal is to help people stay alive longer. So um, it's, it, it's, a, it's a variety of different things, but it, it'll happen. It'll happen in the future. It'll, 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 it'll come. Yeah, so Dr. Seafried, um, do you see this as uh, there's like, a, like in terms of the medical estab establishment, um, even if they wanted to treat patients this way, that there's no way that they can because they'd be held liable um, and they perhaps like lose their, their ability to practice. Is, wouldn't that be a, a concern on, on their part? Well, 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 well I mean, they, 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 they're they being held liable already for the toxic treatment they're already given patients. They got to sign all kinds of paperwork. Some of those drugs are going to kill the patients. I mean, they're already in a liable situation. I mean, what, what, and now you're going to do something that's less toxic and, and more effective, and you're going to worry about the toxicity. What's the difference between a, your, a, a, you think there's a, that ketosis is more toxic than, than high dose radiation? I mean, uh, I mean, let's, look, let's look at it practically. It makes no sense, right? I'm going to lose my license for treating somebody with a non toxic therapy, yet I'm not going to lose my license for irradiating and poisoning somebody. Does that make any sense? Of course not. So yeah. I, I think the, the, whole, the whole process has to be reevaluated. 
And I know Stephanie's not a huge fan of uh, intermittent fasting for, for her own clients. Um, maybe not, I don't know if that's relating to cancer or not, but um, Dr. Seafried, how important is that component in terms of the, the sort of longer term fasts and uh, perhaps just achieving nutritional ketosis through uh, just through dietary um, measures? Well, I, I think this is, you know, again, if you've identified the parameters that, that, that are responsible for nutritional ketosis, I mean, if some people want to do this by water only fasting, or some people want to do it with low carbohydrate dieting or, or various other combinations of dieting that can bring them into a state of nutritional ketosis, the body will know, um, uh, you know, th that's the flexibility that I think, you know, I'm, I'm not going to tell somebody if they, like Guy Tannenbaum, the guy who managed his cancer with uh, prostate cancer with long-term water only fasts. I mean, he achieved it that way. Um, another person said, oh, well, I'm not gonna do what he did. I, I, I wanna use a low carbohydrate diet. E either way, you're still gonna get into nutritional ketosis. Um, but I think that should be up to the patient themselves, the individual themselves, however they wanna get into that. But not going overboard. Like Stephanie was saying, you've gotta be careful that some of these people go overboard and they do it the wrong way and, it, and it end up, uh, they, they could potentially uh, lessen the therapeutic benefit of what they're trying to do by not doing it the right, the right way or having, or having uh, a professional guidance or a knowledgeable guidance person uh, helping them along this, this path. Yeah, I think the reason why I'm so anti-fasting is because everybody does it for weight, weight loss. I've even had cancer patients come to me. They don't do it to suppress the, uh, the, what is it? You call it the, wait, I took notes earlier on some of these terminologies that you're using. Um, the, anyway, to, to the, no, none of these people are using it as a, as a, as a cancer, anti-cancer pre preventative, preventative measure when they fast, even when they have cancer, they're still obsessed with their weight. And so therefore they do extreme measures they don't look at, they're like, I said, if you're going to fast, rest. Don't yeah. go and try to do a bunch of stuff in this yeah. state of fasting, because now you're going to put your body under stress and duress and under the fight or flight system. That's why. But go ahead. Sorry, no, I didn't mean no, to interrupt. I, yeah. I, I, I know. I think that's important because I, I know people who run fasting clinics and it's rest. Uh, you're not, you, you, you don't want your body to be in a super uh, stressed state uh, while you're mm -hmm. trying not to eat those kind of things. So uh, obviously resting, and we, we've discussed that in our press, press, press Pulse paper that we published. Um, there's a lot of what we call um, other therapies that can be added on uh, massage therapy, um, music therapy. There's a lot of things that can reduce stress and stress elevates sugar, cort uh, 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 cortisone, cort uh, corticosteroids go up when you're stressed. So mm. even if you're fasting, you're also, uh, not not putting your body into the best uh, state of health, but not not everyone. Um, I know a lot of people who do water only fasting for cancer, and, and um, they're doing well. Uh, but I either know others who don't. So again, you have to have that knowledge base to be flexible. I think it's not one way or the other. Whatever works best for that patient, using the parameters that you have. I agree. Um, a lot, like I said, a lot of people do it for weight loss. They're well, not they're, yeah. fasting to get yeah. to, you know, to stop the, ta the the tumor growth. They're doing it because of their weight. I swear I've dealt with so many people who have yeah. different types of cancer and they're still obsessed with how they look rather than their own health. It's, well, yeah, I, I know that. And, and I think the, it's, again, it's the educational mission that you have to, uh, uh, you know, let those people know what's in their best interests if they choose. And again, you're never going to get everybody to be completely compliant regardless of whether that whatever strategy you're using, whether it's traditional chemotherapy or radiation therapy or metabolic therapy or whatever it is, there's always going to be people that do not comply with what they are being told, regardless of the situation. But most people will. Most people will. If, if they're told by a knowledgeable person with a lot of experience, they, they will follow the directions because ultimately their lives are at, like, at risk. I mean, let's be honest. I never, yeah. I never understood why people um, are so, uh, you, you know, they, they, they object so much to um, using keto as a, as a therapy and these are sort of more natural therapies, even in, uh, in conjunction with 
conventional radiation or, or chemo, right? Um, my wife is a doctor at a children's hospital. And, you know, one of the worst things I, I could imagine and that I see are these children that are being radiated. Um, you know, heck, even my, my neighbor has cancer. And Dr. Seafried, I'll be honest with you, I'll, I'll share your content with them. Um, typically, people don't, don't like to look at studies or, you know, uh, the literature so much, but uh, sometimes I'll send YouTube videos and they might watch it for a minute or two and then just kind of brush it aside. It seems like they just, they're just like, oh, it's just a bunch of quackery or whatever. Um, but, you know, so, so, so it breaks my heart. And I know you touched base on how, you know, how, how we could potentially overcome that. But, um, you know, in terms of, in terms of uh, managing, you know, infants, you know, you see all these children developing cancer now, and I think the rates have gone up, you know, uh, several fold over the recent decades. Um, how would you manage uh, an infant, say, you know, a child that's, that's only a year old, how would you manage them? Would you also put them on a, a sort of a more ketogenic type therapy or, or how would you do that? Yeah, well, I, I think we're, we're, do, we're doing that now um, with uh, uh, young, young mice actually looking at how to manage the cancer in a more pediatric environment. In other words, a, a young environment. We're seeing really, again, it comes down to uh, diet drug combinations um, because the cancers are basically the same if, it's, if it happens in a one-year-old brain or it happens in a 55-year-old brain. Um, obviously the micro environment of the tumor cells is different in the two, in the two brains, uh, or in the livers or, or the bloodstream or whatever, whatever uh, tissue happens to be involved. But the, but the ba basic shortcoming of the tumor cell being dependent on fermentation is the same. Uh, the, the, the local environment can be different, obviously from the age of the individual, uh, and younger, younger people seem to tolerate some of these toxic um, treatments better than older people do. I mean, this is because the body is in a much higher state of, of readiness and, and, um, and, 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 met and metabolic, metabolic efficiency, I would say, in the young. Obviously, everything works better in the younger. And they tend to live longer despite these toxic treatments. Um, but they, again, like everyone else, they pay a price for this. Uh, the, the issue here is once you understand that cancer is a metabolic disease, then, it, then it's dependent on the professionals in those areas to recognize this and begin to modify their therapeutic treatments in light of this new knowledge. Um, and this will then eventually change uh, how we treat cancer, whether it's in a child or in a, a senior citizen. Um, the, 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 the recognition, and this is the new recognition, that you know what the fundamental problem is in the tumor cell, now you just simply adjust the treatments based uh, on, on the, uh, the age of the individual. So, uh, um, and obviously certain things can be done in children that cannot be done in adults and vice versa. So, so uh, those things will come, become to known and, and modified as, as more and more people come to realize what the nature of the disease actually is. And I think those are the, the modifications that will eventually be uh, apparent. What about outcomes? Like, what are you seeing? I know you're, you don't, you're not involved in the medical treatment of, of these patients yourself, but are you seeing um, certain types of prognosis or outcome that, uh, you know, in, in terms of success rates or? Well, I, I think you can see from Stephanie's uh, story with her mother. I mean, we see, we're, we're beginning to see more and more of these kinds of outcomes. Uh, whether it was from lung cancer or breast cancer or bladder cancer or colon cancer, I, I think the outcomes are, are like, whoa, I'm still alive. How can I be alive feeling so good if I had stage four cancer? Um, you know, we're beginning to see more and more of these outcomes, but then they'll say, well, we don't believe it because there's been no double blind crossover clinical trial to validate <laughs> what you're saying. And the issue is you can't do a double blind crossover to validate this. So what do you have? All of these anecdotal case reports that come more and more case reports, anecdotal observations. I mean, I publish these case reports. Okay, I work with physicians to publish these case reports. And uh, well, it's only an N of one. And, and, I, and I said, you know, if, if you threw a hundred people out of an airplane without a parachute and you put a parachute on one guy, an N of one, and he survives, what do you, we have to do a double blind crossover on something like that? No, you know, so uh, I, I think it's just a matter of, of seeing more and more uh, 
uh, success stories. Um, now, Stephanie relates her success story, but there are many like this, but that have not yet been published in the scientific literature. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think we need to publish these in it, but I have to be honest with you, uh, writing a, a human published uh, scientific report, I mean, I, I have to spend a lot more time on a human case report than I do on the, on the big um, uh, preclinical studies that we do because of all the variables that humans do. Um, they're, they're not as comp they're not as uh, as as compliant as the mice that we work with. The mice have no choice. We we, re we we everything is regimented. Everything is measured. Everything is delivered at the same time. With humans, you know, you find out. You say, "Whoa, this guy is in tremendous management." All of a sudden, his blood sugar goes off the roof, and he said, oh, "What did you do?" Oh, I went out and had a pizza. Well, well, you know, okay, um, but and then get back into ketosis as quickly as quickly yeah. as you possibly can. But you know, we see this, and and I think that to do a large clinical trial uh, uh, on metabolic therapy, I, I think is going to be quite quite difficult, mainly because you have a lot of people that that don't comply. You have people that don't know what to do, how to do it. So I think I think small group reports uh, uh, that need to be published, and the and the general response that people are beginning to see will slowly bring people to the understanding that this works, it can work really, really well, and can work even better than anticipated once we have the knowledge base to support it. And I think that's that's also the, uh, the issue you see with nutrition science, right? It's not like you could lock people in a laboratory and just feed them, right? You're, you're going based on, you know, um, surveys and stuff like that. So is it actually science? Uh, not really, as, as far as I'm concerned. Well, no. If you have the right, if you have the right biomarkers, if you know what to measure and how to measure it, you can uh, actually see the progress. As the person starts to get healthier and healthier, and the tumor starts to regress, you're linking those changes with clear biomarkers, blood biomarkers, tissue biomarkers, non-invasive imaging. You you are using quantitative measures to follow the response of the patient. Also, the other the other possibility the other now Stephanie obviously her her experience um, with her mother was kind of kind of remarkable that it worked considering the mother's resistance to the whole thing, but yeah. but, um, but uh, many patients uh, real have a sense of empowerment when they know that what they're doing is actually uh, uh, participating in the healing process. This you don't often see in the clinical situation where the patient is simply administered drugs or radiation or whatever, and they're not really an active participant in the management of their disease. So, so um, I think when you do metabolic therapy, the patient actually becomes an active participant. Mm -hmm. um, and so you would say that the success rate is, is higher from what you've seen than conventional therapies with radiation? And oh, I, no, I can't say that right now. Uh, we haven't had enough. Um, I would say that if done correctly, under the under doing the correct measurements and uh, uh, following what we know to be uh, at least the first important stepping stone, I think the outcomes will in fact be better. But for me to go out and say, oh, metabolic therapy will outperform any of the traditional standards of care, I think that's possible if it's done correctly under the appropriate guidelines with measurements that need to be taken. Let's compare and contrast. So for example, for glioblastoma, which we just discussed, we have historical controls, right? The median survival for glioblastoma is 15 months. Median survival is 15 months, right? Many people die within nine months. All right, so if we have patients that do metabolic therapy and the average survival is 25 months, then we have made a significant advance in improving that disease. You don't need to do double blind crossover. Advanced lung cancer, stage four lung cancer, has a very poor long-term survival, about, uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 months. Okay, if we do metabolic therapy and those people are living 20, uh, you know, 30 months, that's a major success. So, so we already have the capability of knowing how to do this rel relative to historic controls. So I, I think once, once we know, once we recognize this, we'll be able to move the field forward. And you, you don't you don't see any forms of cancer that don't respond to this type of metabolic therapy. Well, sometimes uh, if the patient has been treated uh, so uh, aggressively with very toxic therapies, um, it's it's not easy sometimes for metabolic therapy to reverse uh, all of this damage. I mean, you're trying to manage an uh, out of control cancer in a body that's been brutalized, 
uh, by toxic treatments. And, and I think that becomes a real challenge for for because many, many patients tell me or my colleagues, they say, well, the physician said there's nothing more we can do. Well, what does that mean? Uh, nothing more you can do. Well, we've done radiation, we've done chemo, we've done immunotherapy, CAR T immunotherapy, we've done every kind of a therapy and your cancer is not responding. Therefore, there's nothing more we can do. And this poor person now is one step from hospice. And, uh, and it's very hard to interject now with a metabolic therapy to try to uh, not only manage the cancer, but correct all the damage to the body that's been done by the toxic treatments. So um, I, I would say that you need to upfront this. Metabolic therapy should be done as the first course of action on anybody that's the most, I don't wanna say everybody, but certainly the majority of people diagnosed with cancer, the first thing they should do is get themselves into therapeutic ketosis if it's possible under the guidance of a professional. And then they, have, then they can uh, uh, weigh their options after this. So doc, Dr. Seyfried, you've been at Boston College for how long now? 37 years. 37 years, okay. And you have no plans on stopping anytime soon, it seems. What's, what's on the horizon for you in the future? And um, where do you see this going with the uh, with your theory on uh, metabolic therapy in, in terms of- Well, I think we, we have to, we have to, you know, we, there's a lot of things that, that, that should be done. You have to document the response of the tumor cells to these kinds of treatments in, in uh, quantitative uh, measures. We, we have to show that, uh, that uh, can we find, can we find a particular type of cancer that does not respond to metabolic therapy? So we haven't found that yet. So, uh, and when people in the literature say, oh, this tumor is uh, not responding to ketogenic diet, the issue is that they target the glutamine at the same time they use that. Oftentimes that's not, they never even think about that. So you have to find a cancer that can survive a comprehensive targeting of glucose and glutamine simultaneously while under the state of therapeutic ketosis. We have not found that yet. Now, not, that's not to say that we will never find a particular type of tumor that can withstand glucose and glutamine targeting while in therapeutic ketosis. Well, I'm not saying we can't find that. There will be possibly a type of cancer in a rare rare type or some sort of type that will do that. We haven't found that yet. So our preclinical studies are looking for that. Our preclinical studies are trying to find any tumor cell that can survive in the absence of glucose and glutamine and the presence of ketones. We have not found that yet. I'm not saying we can't find that. I'm just saying we haven't found it yet. And we need to document that. We have to show that you know, there's no tumor cell that we looked at that can survive under these conditions. If that's the case, then you have a clear path uh, to managing cancer because you know what their vulnerability is. And it, and, and, uh, and it takes a lot of work. It, this is not easy to do. Preclinical studies are labor intensive. They take a lot of time and energy and they're not cheap. So the cost of doing these kinds of preclinical studies requires significant input uh, 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 for revenue for, for the support that we get to do these kinds of things. So, um, so it does take time because it's gonna be a many year process to convince all of the skeptics that cancer is simply a metabolic disease that can be managed this way. And you have to provide data and more data and more data and more evidence to support this. And that takes time, energy, and money. Yeah, I think, I think a huge problem is that um you know, there's just too much revenue at stake there. I think that we'll need those anecdotal stories to pile up and we'll need a lot of people like Stephanie and, and um, cancer survivors to step up and, and, and sort of show that this type of therapy works. Well, it's um, like you need entrepreneurs. There has to be some way to know. I'm not saying that you can't, shouldn't make uh, uh, money or, or, or uh, on these metabolic therapies. I, I'm just saying that that, that uh, b business plan, the business model has not yet been developed uh, to replace revenue generation. So uh, what's in the best interest of the patient? Uh, of course, but revenue generation is also part of the whole thing. And, and you have to find a way to generate revenue on metabolic therapy to make others feel uh, that, they're, that they're, they're not gonna be, it's not gonna be that, that big of a disruptive technology. It is, a, it is a disruptive technology. There's no question about it. Any more than electric cars versus gasoline cars. You know, the, 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 there are uh, disruptive technologies that are part of, of our forward progress. But, but there's adaptations to this. 
and business models will be re redesigned around, around these uh, plans. There'll be re-education. It'll be a very exciting time as we begin to move uh, from one state to another state. But it, you know, it takes time to do this. My job is simply proving the concept uh, of what the underlying problem is with cancer and the best way to manage it. I'm not in the business of trying to figure out how I'm gonna make a billion dollars on this. What is, what is that? That's is, that's irrelevant. The, re the relevant thing is how long can we keep uh, people with a terminal diagnosis alive? Listen, we're all terminal to one degree or another, right? So so uh, uh, we just wanna keep, if, if someone would like to exist on the planet for a little bit longer with a higher quality of life, is there, is there a plan and a path to achieve that? And I say that there is, especially when it comes to cancer. Yeah. I wanna make a bit of an unscripted sales pitch for Stephanie now. Um, Stephanie has been my own personal uh, keto co coach um, in terms of trying to recuperate my own health. Um, so Stephanie, um, maybe you could sort of uh, give us some of your own information uh, if people are looking to switch over to a ketogenic lifestyle, because I can tell you guys from my experience, um, it's not always so simple for people to transition over to a, to a keto diet, especially if you've been eating uh, you know, like I, like I did like crap for 30 odd years. Right. So, um, Stephanie, maybe just, uh, give us your information and, uh, what's on the horizon for you as well. Okay. I'm going to make this very brief because I have a client. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, the, first of all, I, I do all three diets, which is low carb, high fat, which still your body is dependent on starches and sugars. Just a very low amount of carbohydrates rather than the standard American di diet uh, cultural idea of how much, how many carbs and, and, and such that someone would eat in a day. Then I do a keto omnivorous diet where they're dependent on being able to get into a state of ketosis by still eating plants, which I think is very important because of the diamine oxidase and methyltransferase uh, enzymes that break down histamine. So the fiber content is very important. Um, I also coach, uh, a sort of a high fat ketogenic carnivore diet for those who are having like an emergency immediate issue with an inflammatory response to something, it, whether it be a gut, gut issue, a skin issue, a, um, uh, you know, any type of histamine allergy symptom issue, and then I'll put them on a short term uh, therapy. But I think for those who've never done keto before, who are leery and and uh, a little bit reserved on trying to go into state of ketosis by cutting out all their starch right away. I would have them eat some rice, uh, some jasmine rice, a, a bleached rice that doesn't have arsenic in the hull and uh, very minimal phytic acid in, in, the, in the meat of the rice or parsnip. Uh, these are all low um, uh, plant toxin types of foods that people can consume if they're still doing a low carb uh, protocol. Uh, uh, or sweet potato, which would be the third option, which still has some oxalates in it. But uh, you, if people are just going straight from eating garbage to trying to clean up their health, I would, and who are afraid to go and just cut out everything due to problems like having hypoglycemia, feeling garbage, feeling tired, can't sleep, constipation. These are some of the keto flu symptoms that people would experience if they just went straight cold from eating carbs to not eating carbs. I can put them on a lower carb but they're still eating carbs. Their body's still a glucose dependent, uh, higher fat diet, but much lower in carbohydrate than what they're used to eating. Uh, a diet that would be following a circadian rhythm window to try to stabilize their blood sugar. Um, unfortunately, I do not put people on any type of fasting regimen unless it's a 24 hour fast, but that's the only thing I trust them on because humans unfortunately indulge too much on everything. And like Dr. Seifert said that people uh, should be monitored when they're doing something because people don't monitor themselves. They just go all in. They don't try to learn that the literacy as Dr. Seifert was talking about before about scientific literacy, uh, people don't try to learn just the most basic of concepts on how the body works. Just, it's so easy. I'm not a doctor, but yet just because I put a little bit of time into it, I was able to help my mother, help myself, and now at this point, help thousands of people. Just paying attention to the little minute details of somebody's character, how they live their life, trauma, eating habits, uh, people's laziness or lack of information. If you pay attention to those personality types, fear, uh, consume with too much what the mainstream is telling you to do, which is not 
more broad based and knowing knowledge on just something as simple as all our fruits and vegetables have been genetically altered and hybridized selectively bred to be something that is Frankensteined out. What does that beyond the chemical exposure of pesticides and heavy metals in the air and eating plastic and whatever and having blood, high blood sugar? I just try to talk to people and explain to them, uh, simplify food as we're still mammals. We're still, you know, we have all these incredible sensory to survive. I've got horses. I sit and watch them. I'm like, oh, it's raining. They need shelter. Oh, it's cold. I need to go put a blanket on them. I mean, then you, you, I think it's called anthropomorphizing. You put your human emotions on the animals. So I still try to get people to understand that we are much tougher and more resilient than we think that we are if we get away from the comforts of life. It's the comforts that jack us up. It's the real true grit of being a human that makes us feel like we have something to live forward in the future, right? To have purpose. And eating quick garbage food is not the answer. And if you want to change your health, if you've got any autoimmune disorder, any gut issues or any cancer, or it could be potentially leading down the road to cancer, which I think a lot of people are, I think it's going to explode uh, even more so. It's just to explain to people, we are still animals, okay? Looking at your screens before you go to bed, having screens on constantly, not moving your body, which our bodies are meant to be constantly in motion, um, changing your attitude towards yourself. Um, it's, it's once you talk to people on a humanistic level, they do tend to respond. I say to people, I know I'm gonna say stuff you don't wanna hear, but I'm trying to leave a tattoo memory because you may not like what I'm saying now, but in five years from now, you'll remember me. You won't remember all those other people telling you what you wanna hear but you'll remember something that I'm telling you because it goes beyond what you've been taught in the, in the typical world. And I try to explain to people, the body is not that complicated, but it might seem complicated in the very, very beginning. I used to be a pro skateboarder. And in the beginning, they thought it was so difficult to, to drop into a big ramp. It's not difficult. It's not difficult at all. It's not even difficult to do a, a pull up on a pull up bar. Once you understand the, the mechanics on how to do it, it's easy. Once you've learned something simple, like a recipe on how to make a cake, then you just keep using that recipe to survive. We are animals and we need to survive. So I try to explain to people, connect with them on a human level beyond you know, what diet's gonna work best for them. I definitely feel that there is no one diet because it just, does, just depends on people's ability to adhere to something or comprehend something. So I cover all three diets now. I don't just cover ketogenic diets anymore because I realize that Probably 5% of my clients actually stick to even trying to do a high fat, no starch, sugar, ketogenic diet. Um, and on that note, you can find me at stephanieperson.com where I have a course that covers all three diets and um, I do consultations and i um, been coaching people for the last 13 years and 6,000 deep. And I just keep learning from each individual. That's my, um, the, that's, that's my research is the actual people. That's my education. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say that you guys, you guys are both uh, <laughs> personal heroes of mine. It's not just because of the wealth of knowledge and, and um, you know, research that you guys have done, but also because you guys are honest people and uh, it's not always easy to find that in this world today and um, going against, you know, some, some of the great evils that I've come across <laughs> in my uh, 40 odd years of, of living on this world, in this world. So Especially um, with you going through so much with your own health. So I, yeah. I agree. But on that note, I actually have to dip out. I, I'm I not to, thank you so life. much, guys. Yeah, nice. I just wrap okay. it up. Nice meeting you, Stephanie. Nice, nice meeting thank, you too. Yeah, and thank you, Dr. Yeah. Seafried. Yeah. I yeah, would love thanks. to talk to Dr. Seafried myself and go more into, I would love to learn more about the fermentation and respiration and, and, and the non-genetic component to, component to cancer. I want to go to the deep dive, yeah. but on another talk, if you, if you would like yeah. to at some point. Yeah. Uh, send me your email. I can send you our papers. And, that would be uh, awesome. And then you can read them. And if you have any questions, you can always ask me and I'll be happy to try to clear up any uh, um, difficulty you might have at all. Awesome. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay, okay guys. So much, guys. Yeah. Bye.